All right, so um, welcome everybody for the first lecture of the new series of uh, Kastlezingen. Um, in the coming months, we will invite as a guest uh, Anne Duki Jordan. This is next week. Then we have Bianca Baldi. Um, we have Gert Verhoeven. We have Lili van der Stokker, Marley Mull. And we end the 20th of May with uh, Jacqueline de Jong. So um, we start online, but of course, we really hope, uh, as probably you all do, that uh, the following lectures can take place offline in real life, or at least maybe for a small group in uh, real life. Since it won't be possible for everyone to travel, there will be uh, live screenings all the time. Uh, so also if you have the lecture uh, offline, so to say, there will also be an online uh, presence. So um, let's talk about our first guest of tonight or of this series, uh, which is Taos Makasheva, as you probably already knew. Um, I guess a lot of you already knew uh, or know her practice, but for those uh, who don't really know her practice, I'm sure you will uh, learn more about it uh, tonight. Um, but as an introduction, I will say that she often works with others and bringing together different personalities and worlds. It's a search for how culture or civilization is created and what, ha what happens when traditions come into contact with each other. In many cases, her search starts with art history, but without focusing on a particular canon period or geographical place. You might have seen some of her works in recent exhibitions nearby, for example, at Mücke or the Van Abbe uh, in Eindhoven, who have works of her in their collections, but maybe also on biennials like the Lyon Biennial, uh, the biennial we visited uh, with our students two years ago. Uh, and for those who were there, I'm sure you remember the work Aerostatic Experience, a big air balloon hanging in the main hall. And I believe this work can be seen as an arch as, as ar archetypical for her practice, where it's a humorous, uh, poetic and critical view on contemporary society, history writing and gender issues. So the work uh, was created with more than 150 people, uh, people who lived in Lyon and using as a starting point the hot air balloon Le Flezel, which made its first and only flight in Lyon in 1784. Um, and inspired by the learning methods of the costume uh, design students at the Lycée Le Martinière Diderot, also in Lyon, uh, Taos brings together myths, people and efforts to create this work, uh, or maybe better to create uh, new stories, myths and histories. I'm not sure if uh, Taos will discuss this work as well, um, but in this lecture, we'll discuss different recent works uh, of her, actually the, her whole practice. So, of course, it doesn't really make sense for me to um, yeah, go too deep uh, in this work. Uh, only one practical note. Um, after the lecture, there will be the possibility to ask questions. So people who join us here on Zoom, uh, they can ask questions in the Q&A section. And people who join us on YouTube or Facebook, they can ask the questions in the comment section. And these questions will also be answered uh, here. So that's it uh, for me. Then I will give the words to Taos. Uh, Taos, very welcome. And um, we are very happy uh, having you here. Hi. Um, first of all, uh, Godard, thank you very much for the invitation. And it's always a pleasure to uh, share methodologies with uh, my fellow um, colleagues. So I hope it will be interesting and uh, useful, whatever I'm planning to talk about. And yes, I'll talk about our static experiences. Um, and uh, so we're aiming for an hour and a half. Uh, I'll sort of go in depth into the practice. And I usually enjoy artist talks that uh, focus on how artists arrive to a certain decision or to a certain work or to a certain form. And this is how I've decided to structure my own uh, talks usually. And it's also nice to hear that Anne and Bianca, who I know also quite well and have shown with before, and actually what's with Bianca were, the Anne Van Eyck are gonna be also part of the series. Um, so let's start the screen share. Mm 
Okay. So we have uh, a work. Um, this is a work that I've just completed uh, recently for as a commission for France Masserial Centrum. And it's a work um, for a program called Solitude. And Stijn uh, contacted me in, I think, this autumn. And he was saying that, uh, he said that they're preparing this program, which is about how to be, how to encounter an artwork face-to-face, -face, not through screen. So not about loneliness, but sort of solitude and possibility to have something at home, to order something and have that encounter. Um, one of the works uh, that one of the artists that he quoted that is taking part was Nora Turato and she proposed to do a puzzle and also part of the project was that the works don't cost as artists puzzles, but like for example Nora's puzzle costs as much as a, a standard puzzle, so this was also kind of because the I guess the Center. Um, uh, focuses on. Uh, kind of doesn't focus on commercial aspect but just kind of disseminating ideas and that being sort of the primary thing. So uh, we, I've done this work with a studio called Mineral Weather and they're super nice uh, jewelry makers in Moscow. And I call it, uh, I mean, well, part sarcastically, sarcastically, uh, Instagram research because I've been obsessing over jewelry for the past, <laughs> I don't know, um, I don't know, year. And um, I've, been also thinking about what are the skills, narratives, sensibilities that we need now in this moment and we might need in the future. So in the end, uh, the work became this tiny traveling museum in a way, tiny museum that you can order to have for yourself and basically like a jewelry piece. But I don't even refer to it as jewelry, I refer to it as body oriented artifacts. And that's actually borrowed from an article by my mother, Pitsamat uh, Gamzatova, who's an art historian who wrote a lot of, on traditional jewelry. And, and their capabilities to structure something, structure the body, structure you socially, structure you within the society in a certain way, like, I don't know, manifest your status, manifest your emotional state in a way, like, I don't know, you would, uh, for example, like in Dagestan, you would remove one, um, it's not even an earring, it's a thing you attach to a headscarf of sorts called chokto, and you remove one if you, your husband die, uh, dies and you're mourning. So kind of they, they manifest different, I guess, types and states of your body. And that's why I like the name much more. And every, um, every pendant in this set is dedicated to a different skill or sensibility. And for example, one is called, uh, one is dedicated to morphic resonance. And you see this kind of glass bowl with a little compass inside. And the, an idea of morphic resonance is borrowed from Rupert, Sheld Rupert Sheldrake's work, who uh, talked about morphic resonance um, that birds have basically. I think, he, I think he possibly invented the term, but, but don't quote me on that. I, I need to double check that. But he basically wrote a book on it and uh, of how they have this inherent knowledge of where to fly, where to go, where to, uh, I don't know, where to go die or, or give birth. So something that would be, um, that would, we would need and would be nice to have this internal sense of direction. And you can also open it and, and look at this sort of very spiky star and perhaps in my imagination, choose a direction yourself when you open it. Um, there's a, another pendant in the shape of a, a black porcelain walnut. And this is actually, you can see in the box, uh, it's, uh, it's um, enclosed in a small plastic bag at the top within a caramel. So in order to get to this uh, pendant, you have to suck on it and dissolve the caramel and then sort of experience the pendant with your mouth. And here I should also mention um, an artist, Gaia Fugazi, Fugazi uh, also sort of a friend of mine. And she has these beautiful uh, porcelain sculptures for mouths, which you have to experience through your mouth. And I really kind of love this idea within her work, uh, within her work. Um, another thing is, uh, for example, this, these two nuggets on the chain, and they're called Cinque Cord Nuggets. And it's basically uh, to manifest this idea or term, which my friend told me about, um, which is called steam engine effect from cyber feminism. In other spheres, there's also a similar term, like, for example, accidental plagiarism. 
And it's basically when somebody in the world, and, and I don't know, perhaps you have the same idea and realize the same idea without knowing it. And I think kind of as artists, we all know this very um, clearly when kind of you suddenly realize that somebody did the same thing <laughs> that you have just have thought about. And it's just this kind of, uh, I, I don't know, this, this ability to sense the time, feel the time and basically there, there are terms for that. So it's, it's, it's this play on that um, coincident, co coincidental and coinciding uh, plug in into the world or co coincidental plagiarism. And obviously you can't, you can never have like uh, completely identical nuggets. Then there's um, a pendant called fi um, uh, uh, fiber resilience shell. And it's uh, basically, dedicated to the plasticity of our mind. Uh, like for example, if you lose sight, your hearing increases. So it's the same thing. It's sort of like how our mind balances things out. And we've taken like, um, I don't know, a clam shape as a reference or like just kind of a, a shell because pearls, the way pearls are formed, it's basically a small, I don't know, um, bit of sand or an irritant that gets into uh, a, a little sort of shell and the shell covers it with pearly layers because it doesn't want to be irritated. So basically it's just reworking the inner irritant into something very beautiful, re remaking it and finding a generative approach to things. So kind of something like that. And then another uh, on top, the square thing, uh, this pendant, it has an imprint of, um, uh, of a, of a certain, of a cholesterol benzoate crystal that you see under the microscope. And this pendant is dedicated to something that we've sort of came up with or dreamt about called remote synesthesia based on the mere synesthesia, which is kind of when you see someone being hurt, you feel that pain. And remote synesthesia would kind of work just in distance with different people. So all of this, the whole set is about kind of, I don't know, increased empathy, feeling what the world is feeling, feeling, being aware of what other people are feeling, some sort of, yeah, some sort of set, uh, set for the future or for the present. And also maybe another thing, because it's very important for me to know, to understand how the works should function. So the, with this work, it's unsigned, unlimited numbered edition, because we wanted to avoid this thing of, you know, kind of potentially a collector buying the whole 50 first 50 produced and then you know kind of sitting on it and and waiting for the price to increase and that's why and we wanted to make it affordable so basically like it sold practically at its production price which wasn't small but it is a, <laughs> a production price but we will make more once these get sold because we want it to be accessible and to avoid a life within the market rules it doesn't mean that i don't live within the market rules i do but with this work i wanted to yeah just try something different and i think the center wanted to try something different not no try not try allow me to try something different this work uh, was made for musée cantonal de Beaux-Arts in lausanne and it's called 4224 square centimeters of daga and it's basically uh, a work uh, dedicated to a finding of a curator at the museum, Camille, who told me that he discovered that there were pieces of, um, of a pastel by Degas missing. So a pastel, washerwoman and a horse. Um, he compared the one that they have in the museum and the one with the catalogue Raisonnet, which was published after the death of the artist. And there were several strips missing. And I just became so fascinated with that idea, like, who would cut it off? How much does the square centimeter of Degas worth? Like what, like, what is this action actually? And that I basically couldn't stop thinking about it. So the whole installation grew out of that encounter because that's also how I very often start my work. So I, I don't know, I go around the museum, I talk to conservators, uh, architects, uh, people who build it um, and curators and just kind of try to find something that I can't forget. And that's how usually the work sort of develops and evolves. The soft uh, sort of sculptures that you see, uh, I see them as some sort of um, maybe ruins, maybe melted walls of the museum and they are hand embroidered uh, and the embroideries, they, uh, they basically tell stories of how different artworks ended up in the museum, in this museum, museum and other museums around the world. 
like there are uh, phrases like gift of the princess or this work uh, was gifted to the wife of Winston Churchill the one he visited Lausanne which is kind of true and then uh, there are works this work was donated by the family in return for for storing their collection for second world during second world war so it's like it's stories about provenance but also invisible stories because I don't know uh, I'm not sure in Europe, but like for example, one museum in Russia that I encountered, they're very um, they're very attentive when they place uh, when they place a caption next to the work when it's donated by somebody um, by like a patron, but when it's a donation by an artist, it rarely mentions that. I mean, I'm, I'm, it is changing all the practices and all the ethics and all the kind of the uh, I guess the attention to, to provenance is like becoming something else now, which is kind of really brilliant to see. And on the floor, um, there are confettis because I obviously love uh, duplicating work and cutting works up. Uh, are confetti made from uh, duplicated work from the museum's collection of the most expensive and sort of the less valuable ones that are mixed in and you can pick them up because also one of the things uh, the museum was moving into a new building when I was invited and I was invited to do something in relation to that move so I um, just one second so I've uh, so I've uh, I asked also about different fears that people had in the museum and one of the things was I was that I imagined what happens if um, an explosion happens in the storage? What would that be? How would you identify the, I don't know, the value of the works? Because I'm, I'm throughout my practice, I'm very much interested in how the value of the artworks is formed. And also another thing, the museum is built right next to the train station and like right next to the train track. And the building is built in, to withstand an explosion of a, of a train carriage filled with like petrol. And this, I found this very curious that kind of you keep that in mind building a museum and, and then I transferred that explosion into the storage and what happens then. And there are two more elements in the work. One was an audio piece and you can see actually Nicole uh, Schweizer here, who was a curator and who invited me, uh, posing for us as a model. So you kind of put your head through this mattress or it can be a ceiling of the museum because I think a lot of my works are about, I don't know, entering ceilings, walls, scraping things, analyzing what you scraped off. And you, you hear in that, um, in that uh, speaker, a sound and I'm gonna play it for you. So it's basically a sound similar to termites, water um, or um, fire perhaps. And this is basically one of the, one of the fears that um, collection keepers have that's why they didn't even bring any old plinths from the museum because they were really afraid of bugs so it's kind of this like enter through the wall hear this and then there was a text piece uh, written by a writer um, of about 30 minutes long and we'll listen to one story from that uh, piece let us imagine a wholly speculative price of eight million in an unspecified currency for a pastel whose size makes up 84.2 by 107.4 centimetres, no less speculative and made up than the concocted notional prices of any work that rise and fall in the whim of collectors and dealers on supply and demand, on changing notions of good taste, and on those elusive marks of genius. Let us also imagine that this pastel existed at the size of 107 by 124 centimetres, as this work once did, before an act of diminution took place for reasons unknown. According to cold hard logic, if 84.2 by 107.4 is 9,043.08 centimeters squared at the value of 8 million, then each centimeter squared is 885, again, in an unspecified currency. We may suppose then that if 107 by 124 is 13,368 centimeters squared, the value of this surface area as it once was is 11,826,059, with the cutaway piece worth 3,826,059 alone.
It is only logical to reason that a larger work, like a house with more rooms, will be worth more than its shrunken counterpart. Yet opening page 920 of that infamous Encyclopedia of Art, the one that starts in Greece and ends in France, will inform us that the zoomed-in composition, the crop and the fragment, supposedly inspired by compositions of Japanese prints and mannerist paintings, became a hallmark for Degas, evidenced in his works by our uncomfortable closeness to orchestra pits and horses, and by the cropped lean form of Daniel Alavi, as well as by the bottom halves of ballerinas. We must suppose then, contrary to all logic, that the work is at its most precious in its shrunken state. When it conforms to assumptions of Degas's greatness and that 4,224.92 centimetres squared of Degas are worth even less than nothing. Uh, another work uh, is called Seismic Jitters and it was commissioned for Lahore. Um, and I came for a research visit for about two weeks. And the main sort of feeling that I uh, walked, that I left with was that a lot of the architecture, a lot of the places are kind of silent uh, witnesses, silent witnesses to history, silent witnesses to things being repainted, things being, I don't know, violated, people being violated, um, cavities, uh, things being, you know, kind of, I don't know, stolen from walls. And um, I wanted to work with uh, brass and I wanted to work kind of with something shiny. Um, I mean, to try. And I think the actual space was calling for it. So uh, we've done these little sculptures that can be called that way, I guess. Uh, which were exhibited on these super thin plinths and which would shake when you touch them. And I think maybe another important thing was that at the time I was thinking, I called it seismic jitters because I felt that we were living in a state of one or two, um, two level um, sort of seismic activity or earthquake that we don't feel it consciously, but we feel it bodily all the time. And kind of you're looking at what to grab onto, but you can't find it. So kind of, I think the work became about this uncertainty in a way as well. And at the center of this image, you see uh, it's, um, the, the, I'm sure you know this, this famous story of this diamond Koinur which uh, was taken away by the British from Pakistan and uh, recut and is now in the British crown. And when it was recut, it lost 40% of its volume. So we've sort of reconstructed the original cut of it and hollowed it out and built this, I don't know, strange coral uh, from it. So it's this negative lost space from an abducted jewel, one can say. And you can see, I don't know, some of these uh, little things are actually copies um, of parts of the walls that I saw in the summer palace. Some of them kind of are more elaborate fantasies of that witnessing and things being crudely put together and held together. Or maybe kind of just a, a fabric cavity where something was stolen from with some sort of gentleness. And this is just to demonstrate how the plinths uh, shook if touched. Because also I was thinking about the mater material relationship um, of kind of, of, of local people with things because I've, um, it was exhibited in the summer palace and there are crazy at Lahore Fort and there's crazy flow of tourists. And obviously it wasn't for the biennial but they kind of went through the biennial. And, um, and I thought about that and I kind of, I wanted them to touch it. I wanted it to shake. And also we've um, threw around space, little sort of nuggets of uh, brass as well, just to kind of emphasize this golden rush, uh, the, this palatial golden rush and for people to pick it up. There was also an audio piece playing for about 25 minutes in the space. And also kind of the strange fantasy of, uh, for example, one man conversation with his psychoanalyst about his dream that he was an elephant living in that palace, walking on the elephant steps, but then became a woman, then became, and these were like sort of historical narratives with weaved in. And there was a story about this, uh, this diamond, which was narrated from the perspective of the diamond, but we won't listen to it now. And this is, um, this is the work which I did together with, uh, 
uh, my partner, Sabi Ahmed, uh, who's a writer and a curator, and it was called Superhero Sighting Society. I have an alter ego called Super Taos. She's a superhero. And I was invited initially to do just a show dedicated to her at Caddis Foundation. But I wanted to for a while, I didn't want it to be just her. I wanted kind of to have a wider network of superheroes. And we've also wanted to do for a while a superhero summit. So it became a two part thing. We did a superhero summit with uh, I don't know, other artists, superheroes, uh, making presentations and different thinkers also presenting and a game designer. I mean, yeah, for two days and then uh, an exhibition. And for the exhibition, we basically formed temporarily the society and we didn't want to historicize it too much because I mean, some artists are into kind of, you know, discovering a society or kind of creating a large fictional society. But for us, it was just something that was formed in 2019 and we've been collecting witness accounts. So we were collecting witness accounts of different superheroes, but we weren't interested in, you know, kind of American superheroes that would embody a country and, you know, this hyper masculinity or, uh, or of sorts. We were interested in tiny figures like Super Taos or for example, like Super Sokrab. This is a superhero from Iran who doesn't have any superpowers, but sort of, but basically redefines masculinity by his own existence. Um, and this is basically how Super Taos came into being because um, I just met Super Sokrab and I was so fascinated because, you know, it's a guy, Sohrab Kashani, he's a curator and an artist. He wears the superhero costumes and you know, sometimes fails, sometimes succeeds. But I thought it was a very kind of powerful uh, gesture, uh, which I also uh, appropriated. And um, so we've picked about 30 different heroes and we worked with a writer, Jessica Sagsby, who wrote stories about these heroes. So we fictionalized it even more. No, actually we fictionalized it because the original heroes, they weren't fictional, they were real. Well, as real as they can be. Like for example, my, one of my favorites is a Carrie O'Pram Ranger from Japan. And it's a guy that wears a Ranger costume and helps people to carry their prams up the stairs in one particular uh, uh, metro station in Tokyo. And we've written a story from a perspective of a costume shop, uh, rental shop owner in Tokyo. And kind of the story was like, you know, I've acquired, I got this costume, I cleaned it up and I thought nobody would want it. But then a guy came in, he bought it. And I thought, oh my God, he's probably gonna rob a bank. I need to kind of remember him so I can identify him later. And then I saw him at the train station at the Metro station doing what he was doing. And I decided to submit a witness account to your superhero says, uh, sighting society. So there are figures like that. And uh, they were in the audio piece. So there was a five channel audio installation with, I don't know, maybe 12 different languages. I can't be <laughs> too exact now. So there was Japanese, Urdu, French, uh, Chinese, Russian, that would be these, you know, one was like a radio grab from like um, um, emergency services radio saying that Super Towns is holding a rock uh, so it doesn't like destroy a village underneath. Uh, another one was, uh, you know, a WhatsApp conversation between two people that we got hold of. And the scenography, it was uh, commissioned to Super Taos, um, which, uh, who suggest, proposed to do uh, these objects, which are unclimbed mountains. Uh, and alpine climbers call them last greatest problems. I myself was quite surprised there are unclimbed mountains, but also kind of maybe even in a good way. Because the whole thing was about building a landscape. The whole project was about building a landscape and a world from these tiny figures around the world. So that's why kind of landscape scenography made sense. This is a work called Sharivari, which was on our poster. And uh, it was uh, commissioned by Yarat uh, in Baku. And I've, um, I've, I've been fascinated with the circus for quite a while now. I mean, it, it sort of came through in tightrope uh, in several other spaces and it had an enormous uh, space as you can see. And I've never worked on such a scale. So I was quite curious how to work with it. And I wanted uh, to create some sort of a carcass or bones or imaginary circus or a drawing of a circus. And this is basically, I guess, what you're seeing right now. And the work had three elements. The work had an installation that it had a set of costumes which were unwearable. 
And it also had um, an audio piece uh, written by Alexander Snigirov, which were 10 different novellas about the circus, I guess, of the future or of an imaginary circus. Because I also wanted to try a work that would let the viewer imagine more things happening. Um, and not, for example, relying too much on body, body, body performers. And the way we worked, uh, my studio director, Christina, she went uh, to Baku at the time because I was doing superhero sighting society. So I, I, this is my favorite part, but I couldn't go uh, research. And then she interviewed a director of the circus, deputy director of the circus, uh, gymnasts, a clownness, and also worked with Baku State Archive to get photos of the Baku circus. And for example, some of the things you see, the objects, are copies from the archive of the circus, of the props that they had. Some of them we've imagined with the, our architect, Marina Sirova. Some of them, um, yeah, are basically exact copies. So it's a um, collection of uh, things. And this is, yeah, this is just a 3D of when we, uh, how we proposed it. And that's a photo from the Baco archive. I love this sort of animal friendly circus. And this is also how it started, I guess, from the figures on the right. It's uh, Nazirov's uh, gymnast family uh, and uh, from actually Azerbaijan. And I saw them in the film called National Circuses from 1967. And I was mesmerized because, you know, there was like a group from Azerbaijan, a group from Dagestan, which were tightrope walkers, I don't know, a clown from Uzbekistan. So I guess it lingered from the time I was doing research for tightrope, which was like 2015, 2014. And I think it's also important to, for me, it's important to see how things, you know, make a way back uh, into the practice as a current, undercurrent, or kind of, uh, or another layer. We worked with Pani Kaziredia, uh, our favorite costume designer, which we work with quite often. So we worked uh, on these uh, figures that inhabit, inhabited the circus, like a gymnast or, I guess this guy, I call him a disco ball uh, man, but he's also very much relates to uh, space programs because in the Soviet circus, there were a lot of programs or scripts, scenarios dedicated to space travel. Um, yeah, and space programs, a clown, strong man, uh, master of the ceremony. And for example, master of the ceremony costumes, it was all, um, done a bit like a Lego, like a constructor. There were like buttons everywhere. So you could kind of, I don't know, all the hands, uh, all the sleeves were separate, all the pants. And it, it was very much like a constructor because the figure is very much like a constructor. This woman I call animal tailor or a curtain woman. Well, in private. And this is a um, tetra walker. And here they are in the space. And we will listen to a short excerpt from the, the audio. So you, I guess, get the idea of the dreaminess of the, of the stories that occupied and that sounded in the space. Dear friends, we extend to you our very warmest welcome. A whole host of maestros of the circus arts will be taking part in our festive carnival and circus performance. All will be costumed accordingly and will perform alongside trained animals. You will witness the extremes of human ability, violations of the laws of gravity and transgressions of accepted ethical norms. You will hear sparkling, unforgettable dialogues between man and beast and beast and man. Parading before you first will be dozens of athletes, stunt motorcyclists with banners flying, followed on the backs of bowed acrobats by plastic lion tamers, keeping their charges on a short leash. Approaching the royal box, they will hand floral bouquets to the respected elders and prominent spectators. Emerging next onto the arena, will be pyramids of inflatable elephants. Standing on them, hippos. Standing on them, poodles. And on them, a giraffe. 
Once they leave the arena, numerous inflatable flamingos half filled with brandy will be released into the sky. All this will no doubt be rapturously received by the visiting public. Musical accompaniment will be provided by brass fanfares and a group of harpists. The creative abilities of the trumpeters and harpers will be warmly received by the audience. Then, mobile platforms will be rolled into the arena, adorned with garlands of fresh flowers, lettuce, coriander, parsley, and trained Baku tomatoes, as well as sturgeon caviar. If you've never heard of such tomatoes before, you soon will. As you all know, the main property of Baku tomatoes is to disappear. They can disappear better than anyone else. No magician can rival them. Here they are, and then you look again, and poof, they're gone. Only sturgeon caviar can be compared with them when it comes to the mastery of vanishing acts, due to its similar talent for instantly dissolving into space. Our trainers have achieved amazing results with Baku tomatoes and sturgeon caviar. Not only do they disappear now, they've reached a point where they don't even appear in the first place. Nobody except these trainers has ever even seen a tomato with caviar. The axles and all moving parts of the floats will be smeared with crude oil to avoid squeaking. Special sprinklers will spray a mist of pomegranate juice in all directions. A very healthy natural beverage, saturated with vitamins A, B, C and E, and rich in iron, calcium, potassium, phosphorus and magnesium, as well as folic acid and antioxidants. All this will surely be greeted with great enthusiasm by the visiting public. The audience will be presented with acts performed by synthetic bears, a talking horse, a live lion ventriloquist, a touchy sheep, a strong woman accountant, two elephants, and one big top king pole. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, on with the show. So it's, uh, I guess it's this imaginary world, but you hear also kind of unpacking of a certain geography in a way, like kind of trained Baku tomatoes because they are considered the best, like in Russia. That's why they disappear so quickly. I mean, kind of some sort of commentary on, on the way resources disappear, the crude oil smearing. So it's in a way, it's an imaginary circus, but also kind of it tackles the contemporary in different ways. Like for example, one of the stories is dedicated to circus canteen where everything is made from crude oil, like, uh, mousse or sugar cane uh, or um, from crude oil that you can also take away and apply as a face mask. And I was, and basically when I started, I was researching cosmetics made from crude oil, kind of the fact that it's so rich with, uh, I don't know, some sort of some type of protein. So potentially we will eat it at some point, but who knows? And then there are, yeah, basically there are layers of different stories. There's a story on VR circus where you can become an animal, a human. There's a story about animals um, training humans, uh, kind of different types of reversals of uh, the circus. This is the, the work uh, that uh, we've mentioned before, the aesthetic experience, which is actually now being hung at the Freeze Museum in Leeuwarden. I don't know if it will open. I mean, I haven't heard anything about delays or cancellations. I think there'll be an online opening on the 27th of March, but the show will be on for 12 um, months, which is amazing. And uh, they brought Shari Vadi too. So like, this is really rare that uh, such large works get to travel because everybody's trying, like all the institutions are trying to save budget on uh, shipments. And I mean, we're quite used to that also. That's why sometimes, you know, I call it this art mule agency when we just kind of bring things in extra luggage. So um, it started off with me being fascinated, uh, being fascinated with the way uh, students and Lise uh, Marcel Diderot study, because I was really uh, amazed of how it's basically time traveling through skill and sort of, I guess, storytelling through fabric and through shapes that you make with the fabric because I don't know, they can be making one day a 13th century collar, another week they're making a skirt from 1860. And they all, the, all, all these things they do with one type of fabric, this like creamy color. And when we're researching, I mean, we looked at different things. We looked at um, Jacques Chenet actually, which I'm quite still quite very fascinated about this amazing puppeteer and puppet maker. 
uh, and, and, and the museum, the puppet museum in Lyon has amazing collection by him. So we're thinking in that direction. I kind of looked at the silks, I mean, it is France, but then in the end I got stuck on crinolines and hot air balloons. So I didn't go very far from the Frenchness of it. And um, I've also, uh, when I kind of started inter being interested in these historical structures, I found an account of a woman who was citing uh, in, 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 I think, National Library in Paris that said that when crinolines were invented, it was really amazing because they were much lighter structures for, for sort of skirts as opposed to 20 layers that you would have to wear before. And also they protected her personal space from different sort of sexual assaults or I don't know, interests, let's put it that way. I never thought about these dresses, but I guess that's my ignorance um, as something that would define your space and be a protective presence around you. Uh, I thought it's like, oh, so uncomfortable, such a, uh, such such a horrible treatment and you know limitation so anti-feminist and so on and so on uh, but here there was a very different angle and uh, which influenced the work a lot and it became this this is the making of it with the students from the lycée and it, it's 150 people were at the uh, hot air balloon flight so that's a historic number the making I think it was about uh, maybe 12 students with Noemi um, Edel, who led the whole uh, production process at the Lycée. And in a way, once it's hung, it is like a giant uh, skirt structure in a way, um, composed of different support structures for, fe for female skirts that hangs there and defines the space in a way. This is a work uh, called Quantitative Infinity of the Objective. And it started off with my interest in um, outdoor sort of outdoor gyms and uh, physical culture in schools. I, I guess I suppose since I'm a Soviet child in Soviet schools as well. And also different types of oppressive language that is sometimes used uh, in society, in institutions, in educational institutions and in work, uh, I guess it used to be used more, work environments and families. And the work was basically these exercise machines and we've taken the machines that could be uh, used in schools in your physical culture classes, but also that became Olympic comp sports. And we modified all of them, like the, like for example, parallel bars are not really parallel. This, I forgot, sorry, I forgot how to say it in English. This, uh, we say it goat in Russian, basically this, this, this guy, <laughs> uh, much longer than uh, needed. Uh, like every, everything is distorted. Perhaps like our kind of I guess psyche gets distorted with that language. And uh, sometimes the, also the reference was sometimes these outdoor gyms, well, I guess in Dagestan with sort of this um, fountains of masculinity gets bent. And I really like this sort of, uh, I guess, gesture of bending the unbendable. unbendable. And uh, there were performers from a really amazing uh, group uh, in Kiev and um, a six channel audio of that language uh, that I've just cited. And we'll just watch a short uh, excerpt so we understand. But it's this basically, it's, you know, you're a girl, you're a boy, boys don't cry, or you shouldn't wear short skirts like that with legs like that. Um, you'll grow up and then you'll know, why can't you get it on your own? And kind of all these things that keep sort of, uh, I don't know, reverberating in our minds uh, much later too. And I guess the body was this flexible body that is able to withstand, that is able to grow over that language. So in a way also after I've performed, after the work was performed twice, the performers were called Apache Crew. Yes, sorry, I forgot. Um, uh, after the work were performed twice, I felt that without the performance, it became very heavy and very dark. So for a third iteration, which we did for Yokohama Triennial, we added posters and I'll show them to you later. This is the second iteration, which was presented in Venice. Mind your tone. Why are you grinding me up? Oh, oh. Because you're the album. Because, because you're a girl. I'm so disappointed. 
Because I said so. You are never think about yourself. What do you want from it? So, what do you think that behavior is going to achieve? I don't care. It'll all work out if you just listen to your mother. When I was your age. It's too early for you to think about having kids. You'll have plenty of time to get married later on. You'll see once you've had a baby of your own. You think you're all grown up, do you? You can't make a single decision for yourself. Think for yourself. And if they jumped off the roof, would you do that too? Be more like. Be more like. Be more like. I've had enough of you. Ingrid, you don't appreciate what you've got. And for Yokohama, we did different costumes. And I feel like every time we show the work, it changes, it adapts it, it, to conversations. Because also it was like a long distance rehearsals with um, Alexander Sachivko, our choreographer from Apache Crew. And uh, actually in Yokohama, we worked with gymnasts, not with dancers. And then amazing, amazing illustrations. I mean, in my mind, in my opinion, were made by Sha Charolta Santa this illustrator, which were always in the space and which provided that also optimistic tune of a body that is capable, that is able. And yeah, you'll see the, you see the illustrations here. This is a work uh, that was commissioned for Riga Biennial called Dear R, K, S, M, A, and so on. And basically it was a, it was a hole filled with um, portable speakers that you sometimes carry with you in order to feel grounded. Like if you kind of, I guess, live in the art world and travel a lot or used to travel a lot. And there are standing on sculptural tripods because I wanted to imply the flexibility and the possibility of movement, but then kind of steal it from the, from the experience of the installation. And as you walk around, you hear different first lines from uh, emails, second lines from emails, but we'll do, I'll switch on an audio simulation of how the work actually sounded. <laughs> Dear, so sorry for the delay, but I was traveling. I'm also sorry for not getting back in touch with you. I telepathically sent you a message, but not a real one. Dear, sorry for the delay again, but we are very short staffed right now with a departure, a death, and a birth. So there were phrases like, um, I'm, I'm sorry for my late reply, but I was so frustrated with Trump becoming the president. Or I'm sorry for my late reply. I was stuck in a battle with the windmills of my past mistakes. Or I'm sorry, I don't see why I should have an apology. Apologize, I have friends, family, and you're not a priority. Or, um, or something quite earnest, you know, I'm sorry for my late reply. My father just passed away at the age of 53 and I've been away from work for a month and I'm just got just getting back into it. But it's basically kind of as you walk through it, you feel this impossibility or it is about this very different timings, timings of your outside time, timings of your kind of inside production time, thinking time. I mean, if you project it on the art world and artistic practice of source. This is, uh, was a, a work called ASMR Spa, and I did it together with the artist Alexander Kutavoy. And it was commissioned for Liverpool Biennial. Um, and basically, when I first arrived, they took me to different spaces, and I really liked the space in Blackburn House. Uh, because it was used to be first school for girls in Liverpool, and now it was, uh, and now it's education center for women. And when I was talking to Brenda, who was a deputy director at the time, kind of she talked about different things of how women go there, and then by the middle of the year they call they hit something she called a brick wall, 
Uh, and this is when they feel like they're failing with their course, you know, kids are ill, this is falling apart and they can't do it. And then they send someone to kind of for them to help them get through that brick wall. And I really like that sort of gentle repair, the space of, as a gentle repair. And I basically also after Riga, I wanted to do a work about different experience of time and uh, different experience of artwork. Uh, yeah. In, in relation to the time you give it. So um, we decided to do a spa and you could see this furniture, um, you can see a cheek, you can see sort of a bit of hair, you can see a bit of a neck. So basically me and Sasha, we've taken this, I don't know, um, Greek head, which uh, very often students in art schools practice on when if they have like drawing classes, they would start with that and kept breaking it. And then when we saw good pieces, we've sort of confirmed them and he enlarged them into these ginormous bits. So you're lying uh, in a way on a head, you're getting a facial, but you're getting um, also a story. You're getting a script that is narrated by the performer slash, slash cosmetologist uh, written by David McDermott. And uh, what uh, Juliet uh, was saying here, it was basically a story about her as a beautician and her skill and how it's appreciated, not appreciated about the fact that she has mere synesthesia. So every time she does it, she knows what the person is feeling. And she also narrated a story of how a restorer came because he wanted to do get a facial because he wanted to feel what his artworks felt when he was restoring them, what his paintings felt. And funnily enough, because I interviewed two artwork restorers, it's a very similar process, a facial and the painting restoration. And this is how kind of I arrived at that and uh, kind of mentioned it to David. And also um, she talked about different artworks that disappeared throughout history and work, I don't know, became dust and dust became something else. Because I'm also, I, I, I really like this idea of uh, dissolution, dissolutions, uh, remaking things, recycling things into something else. And we actually even developed a cosmetics line for it with the brand 2211, which was yeah, a lot of fun. And it was basically sculptural. There was a cleanser made from clay. There was a toner with, I don't know, silver extracts. There was a, a scrub with mineral granite. There was a wood massage oil. There was this plaster mask that you would take away as this imprint. And then the last thing was my favorite. It was a cream where main ingredients were cotton extract and linseed oil. And it's basically, if you try to make a moisturizer out of an oil painting, that's what you'll get. Um, so you kind of listen to the stories, go through the sculptural process and then absorb a painting and leave. And if you couldn't book the facial, you could watch uh, this whole procedure and listen to it in sort of this ASMR voice um, on the screens in this conceptual spa. This is another uh, work, Rain Road, and I, I was really fascinated for a while of how Ahmed de Guth worked with contracts and what a kind of interesting idea it was to, to make contracts part of the artwork. So um, this is, you know, it was commissioned by an art fair, Cos Moscow, and it was um, kind of this beautiful, heavy object made from dolomite, this mountain with a circular road around it where there's no entry point and exit point. And then there's a public offer, a contract on view, uh, which states that the artist will gift uh, this object of desire of sorts to anyone who commits to building an actual road and then also there was a the there was a budget for building an actual road and around the mountain we picked and i think it came to maybe like a million euros or something like that uh, it was about 60 million rubles. And uh, this was, and basically for me, it's a work about uh, serious relationships and a proposal that will always float in the air and will never be realized. But also, you know, it's in the middle of the art fair. So it's very much about how artists kind of exist, have to exist here, there in order to make their living and yeah, so on. We showed it at the Kaunas Biennial and I actually really liked how it was exhibited there because it was shown at the train station kind of as this passing by mountain. This is one of the, uh, one of the budgets. I have not too many small objects, and, but this is one of them. And this is uh, called uh, Caspian Sea. And it's basically industrial mold for production of silicon molds to bake uh, cakes in the shape of Caspian Sea. 
So I don't know if you purchase this object, you have a choice either of producing 10,000 baking shapes 10, 10, and which each can produce a thousand actual cakes. So kind of, you know, flooding the world with Caspian Sea um, cakes or keep it as this pristine uh, sort of object of value or artistic value. And it also has um, a small sort of uh, embossing and which every silicon shape would have, which says Caspian Sea, uh, 2018 slash ongoing unlimited edition. So it's also potentiality of producing crazy amount of unlimited editions. Um, so this is, I'll maybe say uh, a few words about it. I think it's, it doesn't translate too well in the video. I think it kind of plays with a delay. So maybe I'll just talk about it. And if, uh, if you want, I can just send out a link for you to watch it uh, on your own. Uh, I think this would be a better way. Um, it's a work called Baide, and it was uh, originally was commissioned by Venice, and then it, in 2017, and then it was shown at Manifesto in Palermo also. Uh, I went to an island called Chechen in Dagestan in the summer of 2016, and I was mesmerized by the stories I was told on the way. And one of the stories was that. Um, I don't know, some people call them bioterrorists uh, or illegal fishermen that fish um, quite often for sturgeon and for sturgeon caviar, that sometimes they, when they go out and, at sea and the storm breaks and, you know, their boat capsizes and stands like this because of the heavy motor, they would tie themselves to the prow of the boat for several reasons. If, so if they lose their minds, so they don't drown themselves. And if they die, so the family finds their body. So this was a, this, cold attitude to death and this uh, consideration of hope as something negative so the families don't hope to for their return and have actual like something to mourn over was really striking and once again I couldn't forget it um, and uh, I was thinking about a work I was like oh maybe we should bring these fishermen to Venice maybe we should bring the boats but then thank god it just felt just fake and spec spec Spectacularizing, I think that would be a right word. So I've, uh, I've invited Tim Etchos to work with me on the script. He's an amazing artist, an amazing writer. And uh, basically based on our, I don't know, 70 pages of interviews, he wrote this, I don't know, a little bit of a slapstick comedy, but beautiful text of people in the boat in Venice during the opening, trying to find that performance in the sea. So we see somebody filming on their phone and, you know, looking for a boat and then they find a capsized boat, but then they're disappointed. They're saying like, oh, there's no performers. Maybe they, maybe like, oh, maybe it's a different boat. Maybe it's not the boat that we're looking for, but the, I don't know, the, the captain of their boat says, no, the coordinates are correct. So it's kind of, it's, it's all about, it's about how, how do we look at artwork institutionally? What is Venice opening like? And what are the stories of the of lost at sea boats and people? And of course, it also relates to work or by um, forensic uh, oceanography. Like, it, I, I guess there's a direct uh, link to that. But yeah, mm -hmm. if, if you want, uh, this, the link will go around. Um, this is a research material that I don't usually show, but I thought it was just kind of an inter curious thing to include because I often go to the uh, Russian State Documentary and Film Archive in Krasnogorsk and just kind of search for things at random very often. And some things emerge that also trigger the beginning of a work. <laughs> Самодовольные мерзавцы еще не знают, что им готовится в Сталинграде и на Кавказе. В своем бандитском воображении они уже видели тот жирный пирог, который достанется им после похода. Их арийские носы уже чуяли раздражающий запах бакинской нефти, запах неслыханных боржей и военных выгод. So kind of if you watch this video twice, you see that uh, there's not a single frame of the generals and the cake in the same frame. So it was most likely a beautiful 
uh, dessert chefs of the Soviet Union that came up with this cake. And I found it as such a curious uh, metaphor of consuming, of geography consumption. So basically what I did, I just reproduced uh, a cake uh, in Uppsala. I think it was actually in Uppsala Museum in a room called the Peace Room. It was quite funny. And I've served it to people based on the, uh, on the country they wanted to consume. And I've also kind of done this cake a couple of times, but this was actually the beginning of my food interests and food projects. This is a, something I called artist menu called Stomach It. And this was done for BSC Foundation um, also in 2017 at Palazzo uh, del Zatere. And I, it was an exhibition dedicated to 100 years since the Russian Revolution. And I wanted to say something about the reality of the people. And basically, I've looked at the history of starvation in the country and everything related to that. There was a bread made from um, dry leaves and hay, the mention of which I've also found in the, in the same archive that I mentioned before. There was, a, um, there was a speaker that a girl had which had the sound of rumbling empty stomach and you'd have to come very close to this performer to hear it from the speaker. There was a girl which was serving water and all of this was accompanied with a brochure and for example the water bit had um, an excerpt from an in interview which I conducted with Peter Maganiet who was 91 at the time and he was who was in exile in Central Asia in Kazakhstan and he and I went to meet him initially because I heard that the way they survived is because they're um, I can't say jailer because it was like working camp so it wasn't exactly the jailer but something like that, I don't know, supervisor of their, wor in, of their working camp, uh, was taught them how to eat, uh, to, how to make turtle soup because they were Muslims and they couldn't eat um, any animals without legs. So he taught them how to basically cook turtles. And initially I was interested in that, but then obviously I couldn't serve turtles in Venice. Um, and generally I think I can't serve turtles. And that, but then at some point I asked him if, uh, if they had some juices or compots or like boiled berry drinks. And he was like, daughter, we just wanted enough water to drink. So it's, it's also my own lack of understanding of what that reality was really like. So I included my question and his answer and just uh, she was serving water. Then there was, uh, these are some excerpts from the brochure. And there was a girl who was serving edible food stamps because since uh, 1917, uh, people only received bread, they couldn't buy bread, they would, they would only receive it with the food stamps. And for example, the allowance for traders, clergy and housewives under the age of 56 was zero grams. Uh, there was for, uh, a smell commissioned to Ilya Nastyanka who was a perfumer. So there was a sort of a casserole completely empty and you open it and you smell it and it's a smell of fatty soups because a lot of people, for, especially during Sage uh, of Leningrad, were dreaming about smells of like food smells. And then there was, uh, there was also, we were trying to exchange coal for jewelry if people would take it um, because a family uh, in Dagestan in the 30s survived because of their grandmother that she would sometimes change her diamonds for bread and for a cold in order to keep the country, uh, the family warm. And then there was also a lollipop in the shape of Lenin's head with a chewing gum inside. <laughs> you sort of, I don't know, suck on power, change the face of power, chew the power's brain. And there was a small ribbon that said, new revolutionary lollipop um, with the chewing gum inside, give shape to the leader's brain, something like that. You might have seen this work. I won't focus on it too much, just show a tiny excerpt.
So Rasul uh, Abakarov, he takes across uh, the whole copies of the whole, um, I guess, subjective history of art of Dagestan, which we selected uh, based on the article by Janita Dagirova, and it's, uh, which was the, the first, and I guess the only overview of the Dagestani history of art in, 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 in this fuller version. And it, it was a work about how certain histories sort of slip into cracks and also how much, how scared you are as an artist to say something. Um, how many doubts you have and how much you're afraid if it's going to enter history or enter that side of the mountain or not. Um, yeah, just to say briefly. And these are the photos from Rasul's arc, family archive because it's a dynasty of title walkers and I just really love them. And I think one of the reasons I was really happy that Moose Publishing together with VC published a book on title was because we could include these archival films. Like that's his great grandfather walking on a tightrope between two moving trucks. Like can't get any better in my mind, to my mind. Um, uh, another part of the work grew out of my encounter in, at the circus school in Dagestan, in Dagagni. And uh, because I saw this pyramid and I also started thinking about how can I do also performance with the same collection. And this is how the performance came uh, into place, uh, which was called on the benefits of pyramids in cultural education, strengthening of national consciousness and the formation of moral and ethical guideposts. And we've done it together with the circus uh, students uh, in Moscow. And it was also similar ideas, body as a support structure for art history. And I think in my mind also, it was part dedicated to the staff and the collection keepers at the Dagestani Museum of Fine Art, where we worked with a lot and where we selected the works and made copies of the works. This was at uh, Van Abe, and it was a, I don't know, mini solo show of sorts, uh, which was called Storeroom. And it was actually dedicated to um, Dagestani Museum of Fine Art. And as you enter, you see this film from 1967 as sort of a pretext, uh, but not as my work, just as kind of research material or something that stayed with me that triggered the work. Because uh, Van Abe and Mukha, they share the, all the works that were in the video. And I guess Manaba collects in the same way, they collect artistic collections. So it, 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 like it made a lot of sense. And they also hold one edition of the video uh, for the exhibition. And actually, now that I look at this photo, the performance uh, of the pyramid performance it now lives as um, photographic wallpaper. So kind of some things I know what they can become, sometimes I don't, but with that particular work, I felt that it can't be a video documentational performance. It makes more sense, for example, as wallpapers. Um, we've exhibited all the works from the video and also uh, Van Abbe commissioned the performance for which we made these structures. And in the performance, there was actually one collection keeper tools participating and two of the um, I think volunteers uh, from the museum, which was actually really nice to work with someone who, were, who was sort of very much involved uh, with Van Abe. And that performance was based on the interviews with collection keepers, which didn't, uh, didn't get into the book, but I felt that their voices and their choices and their appreciation of the collection. And it's basically kind of people working for, I don't know, 100 euro salaries, clearly not for money, but just out of love uh, and admiration for all these artworks, which I have a lot of admiration too. Um, there was another work shown there called Way of an Object, uh, which is also dedicated to that museum. And I'll just say a few words about it. It's actually in the collection of Mocha, so sometimes I think they exhibit it also. Um, it was, uh, it was, it, were, it was puppets because since I saw Cabaret Crusades by Wael Shaki, I was really fascinated by puppets. And also one of my favorite people is Ronnie Burkett, uh, who's this amazing, amazing puppeteer in Canada, uh, if, in case you want to have a look. 
And uh, basically there are, I've picked three objects from the Dagestani Museum, like this bracelet, uh, which is made in Kubachi village. And it's a wedding bracelet that you wear only once in your lifetime when you get married and it's passed on from the mother to daughter. And then a salt box, which you usually buy without a design. And then as an owner, you carve out a design and it's some sort of ritualistic opening uh, of the eyes of the object and becomes this kind of a little pagan god-like figure, but also salt being the main preservative in the mountains. And also kind of, for example, this particular design is a swirl or a labyrinth for bad spirits to get lost in. So they're very, they're very alive, uh, this decorative, uh, an applied arts object. And then another thing was Gamayun, the prophetic bird by Viktor Vasnetsov, which ended up in the collection from Savo Marozov's collection. And originally I think it was in Tretyakov gallery and then it was sent to Dagestan because there was this program in the Soviet Union of sending important artworks and important artists to regional museums. So everyone across USSR would have this equal access to high, so-called high culture. Um, and these puppets originally first iteration i've made them it was just a box with puppets and a short text then i thought that's not enough because i don't want to i want to give them a voice i don't want to leave them voiceless as they are in the museum so then we created a performance and andri krishkov wrote a text for them and it was performed at the opening and on several days as well. And then later on, we made it into an audio. So now it's an audio piece that you can listen to when you're in the exhibition. And we end with one of my uh, favorite <laughs> people or uh, maybe a parallel life uh, of mine. And basically it's Super Taos. And I mentioned her a little bit before um, who appeared and came to life when I met Super Sohrab in Tehran. And um, also it's like, I really like this quote by Hannah Arendt that in dark times we have no choice but just but to become light, light sources ourselves. And um, she appeared also, I think in kind of in a, in a difficult moment, I guess for me politically. And she was just someone who just does it. Uh, and we'll just watch a short viral video, which is possible to download on my Vimeo account, because like if you'd, if you'd like to own it or share it on WhatsApp, because also that's the life of the video that needs to happen uh, in this case, because it needs to be disseminated, shared, it needs to appear on different strange platforms. <laughs>
And I think her life is also an homage to a lot of my female uh, relatives in Dengston who just kind of do stuff. Um, and I think it's also curious how different alter egos exist. And my friend Dasha Khan once asked me, so, so when she's not here, where is she? And I said like, oh no, she's living her life. She's living her life in Dagestan. She's married, she works in a kindergarten. She has her own family. She's building a house now. So it's, it's a parallel thing. I mean, for some artists, alter egos is someone you download from Cosmos or you become or you, and for me, it's like this, I don't know, potentially a life I should have had or a life that I'm having parallel. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an existence which coincides. And for example, she doesn't, she doesn't consider what she does as artwork because she's not an artist. She calls it life affirming practices. So there's a whole, um, there's a way of understanding of what she's doing and how she's living her life. And this is just an example of how things uh, come back. This was a video from 2010, which was called Endeavor where I push a rock for nine minutes and nothing happens. And then you know, four years later, super ties appears and this self enabling takes place. Not my work, but one of my favorite works by Galina Kalapatska, Cosmic Mother from the seventies. And I think it's a really incredible work. And I see this woman in the painting as a, some sort of predecessor of super Taos. Um, another life affirming practice by her, uh, which is called Untitled 2, and it basically relates to a story which uh, she and I found out um, that in the 90s there was, a, there was an attempted theft of a Rodchenko painting from one of the museums in Dagestan, where a thief cut out a painting, a canvas from the frame and started running. And two invigilators, Maria Karkmasi and Kamisar Abdullayeva, stopped him. Um, and somehow took it back. But none of the newspapers mentioned their names. They mentioned that the police stopped him or that another newspaper I think mentioned that it was one male um, worker from the museum which stopped it. But I interviewed him and he said he didn't, it was the woman. And then Khamisat also, who was still alive before when I interviewed her for potentially, for potentially this project, she also said that Maria, you know, stopped him, she told her and uh, so on. So it was also a way of excavating that story. And Super Taos did a monument, bronze monument to the two of them and tried to place it within different uh, spaces. And this is at Pompidou. This is a sketch because also in Dagestan has a lot of uh, monuments to named to specific men, but to women, it's more of a, I don't know, a mother, a teacher, a more generic role monuments, let's put it that way. And this is in Dagestan. Uh,
And this is another life affirming practice, of course, called Quick Fix. Um, basically commissioned for an art fair for Armory Show, uh, but for a curated section by Sally Talent. And Super Taos didn't really trust anyone to make uh, her booth. So she made this traveling case, uh, which she just brought in and then uh, uh, erected in the art fair space. And the, the practice was that you could throw a dice, anyone could throw a dice and would I, it would either be yes or no. And if yes, you get a trophy and she prints a label of any competition that you ever wanted to win and you took it away, you take it away. So quick fix. And the last work that I'll show, uh, because I think it rhymes with the aerostatic experience, it rhymes with maybe super towels and um, other things that we, and threads through other things that we've seen kind of in terms of structures that I'm interested in, um, yeah. It's basically, I guess, two uh, brides or bride and a groom that navigate wedding halls in Dagestan, searching for each other, for comfort, for, uh, I don't know, the future, the potentiality of the future. And yeah, this is the last thing we'll show, watch a three minute excerpt and then we'll go on to questions. I think we're also in a way maybe walking napkins or parts of the space that came alive. And want to play hide and seek.
And I just wanted to say that um, basically you can ask me anything. Um, I don't know how the studio is structured, how projects come about, uh, what is the money logistics, like everything you've ever been ashamed to ask, you can, you can do this now. Right, so maybe I will start um, with asking uh, uncomfortable questions. No, but, but thank you very much, uh, Tao. It was really uh, so nice to uh, see all the works you, you made and the, the diversity of it. Uh, I think it's really inspiring. Um, a question I have, it was something I didn't really realize uh, before, but also because you uh, talked a lot about where the, let's say the art world's uh, dynamics. Yeah? So how you are dealing with like the first work, uh, the commissioned by uh, Franz Mazarel Center, that you're making an unlimited uh, edition more or less. Then you're talking about the provenance in uh, Lausanne, you're dealing with this. Um, you did a survey in the museum, uh, you're questioning the value of artworks. Um, then, of course, Baida as well, your interest in the, the, the artist contract. So, somehow I realized we're really dealing with, let's say, the market dynamics in a way. Uh, you're playing with them, uh, you're commenting on them, um, but of course, you also need those dynamics, of course. Um, or some of those elements. I was wondering if you maybe can elaborate a little bit how you see yourself positioning in those uh, contexts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for the. Thank you for a, a very acute uh, observation. But I, I don't know if your question is how I survive uh, within all of these games. No, it, it's just uh, if you can elaborate a bit on your your interest in playing with this, and because there is uh, like the idea you're, you're dealing with cultures, you're you're dealing with myths in your works, uh, like all these things. But then there's also let's say the myth of the art world you are uh, playing with very much, which was something I didn't really realize before. Um, I yeah. Think, yeah, I think I'm, I've always been interested in the edges of the body or system and, you know, kind of uh, wiggling. I, I, I love wiggling systems and I don't know, um, uh, trying to push. In a way, like the, the work is not, it, it is not, but it is very body oriented. It is very much about testing edges, pushing things, pressing against the edges, seeing how far you can go, even how far you can go in production when you work with people and seeing what happens when the body is pushed to its limit. And it can be a body of an institution. It doesn't have to be a physical body. Mm -hmm. So like, I guess it's always, first of all, I guess Goldsmith gave me this uh, terrible but productive anxiety of doubting everything which um sort of manifests in this obsessive doubting but which allows you to arrive somewhere further than you could have if you just kind of stuck to um initial uh thing that you thought about um uh, so yeah i think it's um it's it's testing the borders of institutions that uh, interest me a lot because I just, I'm just not interested in taking things as they are. Like, mm -hmm. why, would you, why would you do that? Why, why would you not try to uh, push the rules, change the rules and see if you can uh, amend them and just, I don't know, see, see a, a different, um, see different workings and different machines. Mm -hmm. Because, because of course, yeah. there is maybe some uh, critique in it, uh, like some institutional critique, or maybe more some art world, art uh, world critique. But it's in a very playful and uh, maybe not that heavy way. Yeah, I mean, I love humor. I really mm. love humor, and I hope it came across. I mean, it's difficult to do talks like that on Zoom. A little bit difficult because you don't see faces, you don't hear reactions, you don't kind of hear if somebody laughs at what you're saying. So I hope I hope you were, uh, some of you were at least. So I think it's an amazing tool and I'm interested in this uh, 
second thought after you laugh in this like what did I just laugh at it's like it's 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 like I'm interested in this also like like questioning what wh why do you find this funny and what you find funny and in terms of institutional critique I remember I think maybe my BA dissertation or one essays were I think it was called institutionalization of institutional critique so I think it's not like you can't say like anymore that it's an institutional critique because it was just, it's so absorbed by the institution. Mm. Like I am a very much institutional artist. I am sort of a biennial artist and I, I wiggle things from the inside. And I think kind of, I think it's fine for me, it's fine to wiggle things from the inside because to me, the, the, the choices, they always come from considering the audience. The choice to participate in the show is very, it's, is always a decision because of the audience, even though like I'm sick, a little bit sick and tired of showing Tightrope because it's traveled to so many exhibitions. Mm -hmm. I still wouldn't say no if a small biennial uh, in Turkey approaches me because I know that the audience there would, would not make it to Venice, would mm -hmm. not make it, like to Manifesta or would not make it to somewhere where the work circulated already. So kind of my choices are always for, for people to see the work mm -hmm. and for works to travel. And of course, this maybe has also something to do with your background, uh, like the Dagestan uh, background, so to say. Yeah. Really. In the, the museum uh, that's there. Um, we have some questions. Uh, um, um, I hope I pronounced the name in the right way. It's, uh, um, I think it's Chanel Delmot. Um, and uh, how, how do you come up with uh, the titles uh, for your artworks and how important uh, are they to you? So uh, some of the artists I don't even come up with, uh, to be completely honest. Like for example, a title, uh, Quantitative Infinity of the Objective, it was um, my um, project manager came up with this because he was reading a book on how sports uh, developed in schools. And he said, oh, this is an amazing phrase, which means when sports stops being a game and becomes something, a result you can, which is unattainable, quantitative infinity of the objective, you can never be good enough. And for example, the work, the pyramids, this was a title and it was, uh, um, it was, and somebody else came up with it, a good friend of mine, Alexey Maslyaev, who's a curator, so sometimes it's me, sometimes it's other people. And of course, like for example, with Pyramids, it's a hilarious, super funny title. And it adds some, it adds a little bit of humor to it, but it also hints at the system, at the Soviet museum system, and generally as the Soviet sort of sports system, body system. And, um, uh, and actually we had a bet with uh, Alexei at some point and he lost me. Um, and he lost something which I'm quite happy about. I said that, you will have to, until the end of your life, you'll have to come up for a title with titles uh, for my works. Uh, so I have this uh, pass <laughs> to, to call him every time I need a title. I don't do it, but yeah. Um, I guess I, I should, like, I usually acknowledge this in talks. Today I forgot that maybe it should be acknowledged and more of a, like a star thing, but kind of texts, I, uh, conceptual texts about the works we always acknowledge, but maybe that's something actually, thank you for the question. I need to think about that more. Mm. Yeah, we have two questions that are a little bit similar, so I will uh, read them together. Um, when you start an artwork, do you always have a strict plan to work from, or, or do you let uh, the artwork grow from itself? Do you let uh, coincidence have a role in the progress of making? And the other question, which I think is quite similar by Alan Burvenich, uh, is every work uh, told through in advance or can it change on the road? So uh, I don't have a plan. Um, I think my studio would want me to have a plan, <laughs> but it's not always the case. Like for example, with mining serendipity, also I tend to get excited. With mining serendipity, I think it was meant to be one pendant on a chain. And then I was like, no, no, it's getting somewhere else. Like I want a segmented chain because that doesn't like an ordinary chain doesn't work. And then it should be like many, no, like five is not enough. Like phew, not one. So I think the word grows and it always changes. Like I, I really start from tiny things. 
I want to, like I, I propose something small and this is also kind of feedback into that sometimes I don't estimate my fees well enough because the amount of work is here fees like less um, but I mean some institutions are kind enough actually to adjust it later seeing how much work was put in but yeah there's no there's no plan I think and it's as I said, I start with like, just like with Baku, for example, I came back and I asked my uh, researcher to, um, or research with that we outsource right now to look into cosmetics from crude oil, uh, urban myths and Baku, uh, for example, a lion that a family kept in their flat also in Azerbaijan, uh, um, cave paintings. So it was just like this whole world that I was curious about. And then while looking at it, I narrowed it down to circus. And then the work starts evolving. I, I, I know I want to play with scale. I invite an architect who builds something together in 3D. Then I invite a costume maker. Then parallel work with a writer. We send him all our research. Then he comes back with a draft. Then we discuss and so on and on. So it forms and it changes. Uh, it changes within. And I think it's absolutely natural for it to change. Uh, I mean, I sometimes find myself uh, going back to something I thought about briefly at the very beginning. And I was like, oh, maybe it can be that. And then kind of my research and my pondering confirms mm -hmm. that I should go back to that and dig that. But that's not always the case. Sometimes along the way, I find something else which sort of uh, flourishes. Death or itself. Co coincidence, yes, uh, there are findings, there are accidental findings, findings. And I think also it's very important to allow your team or your collaborators to have their say and to allow their expertise to become part of the work because it's, um, yeah, because like the people I encounter and the stories they tell me are incredible and they're very often uh, in the works. Mm. Because maybe also to elaborate a little bit on that, um, like you have not a huge studio, but still I think it's a, it's a big studio. Huh? Um, and then if I uh, remember a couple of years ago, you were in the Liverpool Biennial, uh, you were in the Lyon Biennial, I think Manifesta was more or less the same time, uh, and Riga, which were all very diverse projects, it were uh, big exhibitions, then you had institutional shows. So I I'm wondering, like these ideas were so diverse, it's not, and, and do you have uh, a big stable of ideas that you can pick from? Like, how do you start this uh, to do so many different things? I have no idea. No, um, actually, to just to mention, if you, if everyone, if anyone is curious, I saw a beautiful studio tour by Ryan Gander, and I think it's on in his stories on Instagram. And for example, in his studio, he has his own room. Obviously, I mean everything is his, but he has his own like. Um, workroom study where all his ideas are printed on the walls around him. I don't have that. Um, and I don't have like a, a pool of ideas. I mean, I have some ideas which are realized in, not in relation to an exhibition, but very lately it's been sort of commissioned because like when things are commissioned, you know, you have a budget, you have a fee. It's not like you don't sort of fundraise separately for a project. So um, working parallel, I think basically it became, I guess, I am, I am excited and in a way greedy to make more art because what happened to me after Venice, I was climbing there thinking, oh my God, this is the Mount Olympus. This is the epiphany of my career. This is it, I've made it. So I climbed there and then I got depressed because nothing changed. And it was a bit of a, yeah, basically just, just, just nothing, nothing inside me, nothing, not much outside. And I was like, oh, damn. And then I started thinking about my art making not as a not as a series of institutional steps to climb there, but as a license and a mark of potentiality and a, a possibility to experiment. And that's what I'm doing with every work. I'm so so lucky to be able to experiment with forms, ideas, and I don't know connotations. So I'm, I've, I think I went somewhere a, a little bit far uh, with your question. Um, wait, I need to go back. What, what was it again? No, no, it was just how you were able to do- oh, Parallel, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the first projects. So in a way it became, because I'm not a very, I don't have like, um, I'm not 
bought by private collectors a lot because I think it's also like it's a different type of effort and I haven't like I don't I would I can't say that my career was built by galleries I think I just worked a lot I had some good relationships with Laura Bullian, Laurie Shabibi, narrative projects galleries and they've done kind of important things for my career but I I don't share that thing which I often see young artists uh, kind of thinking about and aspiring that, you know, if you have like an important gallery, that's it, your career is made. Because to me, it was, it was, it was a, it just, it was just a very different path. It was kind of, in a way, I'm like a biennial artist, institutional artist, and I don't very often disseminate my work through art fairs, for example, which is not a very bad platform because art fairs, well, now I'm not sure, but it, these were the places that used to have money and kind of curators would come and do their research in the art fairs. So um, it, so in the way I survive financially is through artist fees for commissions and sometimes sales. So in order to make my practice sustainable and to support my studio, I have to do parallel projects. I have to do a lot of exhibitions. I have to, you know, do just send works and not travel and allow them to be shown. I have to gently bargain for fees when I'm offered like something for an exhibition. I say like, I'm thank you so much. But in order to make my practice sustainable, I had to standardize my fees. And this is, this would be great if you can offer this. And most of the times people do because like, all artists, they have different presence in the market. Some of them are doing incredibly well and they don't care if it's a 2000 or 4000 fee for a biennial. I do uh, because like the practice is different. It's institutional, fees are important and uh, so on. So parallel thing is a necessity. But for example, that moment that you're referring to, it was actually there was Liverpool, there was Riga, there was Manifesta, thank God Manifesta was an existing work. And there was also, there was also a biennial in China at the time, um, which I forgot the name of, unfortunately. It was created by Marcos Catini. This was also existing work. So I had to divide, like I went to two places, to Riga and to, to install into Liverpool. And my assistant went to like, um, to install in China. So- Lyon was also, was 2019. Uh, yeah, Leon, no, no, this was 18. Yeah. Uh, Leon was later, 19. I think Leon was, it wasn't too, too packed. It was uh, no, Leon no. and then Superhero Sighting Society. I think it was, it was an, okay. Oh, there was Mishwara. But that was existing work and I couldn't go to the opening. So I just actually came for the closing, which was a beautiful biennial curated by Anka Ryu and uh, Maria Lind. It was really special. And yeah, so uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure, but it's also a necessity for me. And mm -hmm. the Riga and with Liverpool, I, these works were, I mean, they were realized kind of uh, close, but they were in production for like a year. Uh, li li Liverpool was like for a year and a half. I was thinking about it. I was doing it and methodically working on it. And the Riga kind of a bit of a shorter span. But for example, with Riga, part of the production was in Moscow. The tripods were produced in Riga. They had amazing kind of production team. Uh, Liverpool also a lot of the things like me and Sasha and his drug, his friend Anton, uh, we three of us went to Liverpool to make these sculptures. I mean, I was just kind of a, 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 a courier girl, I would say I couldn't be, be making them because I don't know how to. Uh, so um, yeah, because shipment was impossible and mm -hmm. Sasha agreed to go for two weeks to make that incredible installation. So. Uh, yeah, you sort of make ways and plan things, but in terms of the structure of the studio, very long answer to one question. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, right now it grew. At the time, uh, it was only one assistant. Now I have a studio director who's full time project manager, who's full time an archivist, and two assistants which are part time. It's very precarious, but I'm doing what I can because. Like I really love being able to do multiple projects and kind of work on multiple things and kind of mm -hmm. uh, juggle things around as a circus mm -hmm. acrobat. So um, another question is, where can we buy uh, the mining serendipity? It's on their website of the France Masserial Centrum. Just yeah, go click and it will be delivered. <laughs> well, it's an anonymous attendee, so maybe someone is trying to make a bit of advertisement. That's also possible. <laughs> Um, so then, uh, uh, Emma, so thank you very uh, much, I guess, for the inspiring lecture. We had some good laughs. 
Uh, I have a few, few questions. Uh, is this interest for the art market uh, something you only in the last year got interested in, or is it something you have been interested in your whole career? Um, something that I really noticed was that uh, you collaborate a lot with other artists. How do you come to find them and how do you uh, build these relationships? So, the, yeah. yeah, so the art market, I don't know, art market maybe. Um, mechanisms is maybe a better. Uh, yeah, term. so art market mechanisms. I don't know, maybe five, last five years of sort. I mean, maybe, but also I'm kind of saying it on top of my head right now. Uh, before, I think I was interested in systems, even Tightrope is interested in institutional systems. And earlier on, it was more sort of poetic systems that I was tackling on. Um, yeah, I think that's a short answer. Uh, collaborate with other artists. How do I find them? I, 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 I get in touch. Like, honestly, I just, uh, with Sasha, I loved his sculptures and, and just his works. And I just basically messaged him. With Tim Etchells, I've been to his lecture once. And uh, I have I sort of like thought that he would be amazing to work with. And I just kind of like got his email. I can't even remember of who and emailed them him absolutely at random, like super nice email explaining that I'm doing this for Venice and it'll be amazing and I love his work because he was the one that wrote a script for Elm Green and Draxa Drama Queens. Mm. I, like, I really like that work. I think it's amazing. It's like copies of uh, important 20th century sculptures that have a conversation like, in a, as, a the, like as a theater play. So out of the blue, he, we, zo we Skyped, he said, yes, he like, it was, uh, I could afford like a sort of okay fee because of, like with the budget we had. So mostly it's, it's just like that. And for example, uh, David McDermott, the writer we worked with, it was so like, this was like real serendipity because basically I just met him in Berlin at a bar and a friend of mine said, well, I mean, it was a friend of a friend. And a friend of mine said like, oh, he's a really amazing writer. But I haven't like, and this was like, I don't know, maybe three years before. And then in Liverpool, I was like, oh, who can I write? Well, I was like, should I look up that guy? Like for some reason I thought, and I messaged him. He's in Liverpool then because he was from Liverpool, which I did not remember. I look at his stuff and I realized that even though he was writing for TV drama, like I feel like this is the guy that can like, that can be flexible, that we can have conversation with, that is very, I don't know, empathetic, feminist in his own way. Um, so yeah, and it's, I mean, in terms of building a relationship, I guess it's always a friendly relationship. And you also, you ask, what are they happy with? Like, how do they want to be credited? Uh, it's, it's always like for a project, even if I don't pay, I pay collaborators and then later, whatever, if the work sells or if I, um, or if I show it somewhere else, I'll get like a fee through that. So this is important. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I, I hope- but I can also imagine that it's, because now it's that you have an idea for a project and you find someone to collaborate with more or less. But I can imagine, for example, as the rope dancers, that you find out about this family and that you, with this family in mind, start thinking about this work. So it's more maybe the other way around or... With Tightrope, it was, um, it was actually, I was horrified by something that happened because I found out that uh, one of the museums in Dagestan was forced to move into a new building within like one week. And I was like, oh my God, but works during wars are evacuated for a longer time. How can mm -hmm. this be done? How can sort of culture be a servant like to the state's whims and mm -hmm. desires? So this was actually kind of my annoyance and anger. And then I, I even, I visualized this tightrope between two museums in the city, but thank God I decided to move it into the landscape. So I had this vision of like danger, precarity, works being on the edge of destruction. And, uh, and then I started looking for Tightrope Walker. So mm -hmm. uh, Malika, she went to a festival of Tightrope Walkers in the village Tsovkra, where all the Tightrope Walkers are, come from. And then, uh, and then I found that film and I found that family. And then I kind of, uh, I think it was Batya Ataeva, uh, another assistant that I had at the time, who found, uh, who got in touch with Rasul. And kind of later, I think even later we realized that he was the descendant of that family whose film I saw and I thought about. So it was, yeah, it, it, it's kind of... Um, it really comes together so well. 
it's almost too good uh, to be true. I mean, I like uh, CV narrates much better than when you live it. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. I narrate it better. Like you don't see the doubts and the turmoils and things like it. Like when things mm -hmm. are narrated briefly, they always seem uh, magical, but it's, <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. not always magical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the last question I've heard by uh, Naomi. So she writes, I first want to thank you. So thank you, Taos. Uh, my question is, which advice do you have uh, for me as an aspiring performance artist, but also for an aspiring artist? Uh, archive well. <laughs> archive everything well. Um, and just... Um, yeah, I, now I'm just trying to structure my archive and I find things that are mm. like works that were, that we left at art center. Like there was one work which we left for six years at an art center. Thank God we emailed them and they sent it straight away. So I, one thing is archive well, but then again, like I think I remember a moment when nobody would invite me anywhere. And I've decided not to focus my energy on, I don't know, open calls on fundraising or, or searching for funding, but just making works with whatever means I could. And to me, like that choice into work making and working on your practice is also the, it's always the most important. And I like to read the story that, you know, the way I ended up in Venice is because Christine Marcel, she came to Laurie Shabibi Gallery and she saw a title there and she invited me because she liked the work. There was no, you know, schmoozing or anything. There was no like um, extra strange workings within the art world. Of course, I was perhaps in the right place when she was visiting Dubai and the work was shown. So there was a moment that the work was seen, but then I'm a real, perhaps partly naive believer that the work has to do the work. Your artworks kind of does it. Um, if you put uh, time and um, just, uh, yeah, if you fight, uh, fight sincerely for it and in it. I, I know it's very, uh, sobby, very sobby, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but I think it's uh, like, it's, uh, it's nine o'clock and I think this is the perfect uh, good night. Uh, uh, it's, it's a perfect sentence to end with, I think. I'm really looking forward to the studio visit. So yeah, we can we can look at your practice and uh, yeah, so. Yeah, so Taos, thank you very much. Uh, as I said earlier, I think it was really inspiring and uh, like we saw so much uh, humor and maybe more important, uh, so much joy in your work and I really loved Super Taos uh, so much and we'll be on the watch out to see uh, where Super Taos uh, will go to. So thank you very much. And um, I feel really sad we cannot put our hands together for you. Uh, otherwise we would give you a big applause. Thank you and uh, hopefully we stay in touch. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation.